Good morning. Uh, coming to you from uh, the office here at Shore. Uh, this is going to be a, a little different for everybody. Uh, it's a beautiful day out there, but we're not having church today because of the uh, virus. And uh, we have been, uh, we're doing, we've been told to be better to not meet if you don't have to, just to stop the spread of the virus. And so we want to pay attention to that and, and do that. Um, I really feel led to, to give this message. It's, it's interesting. Uh, months ago, um, God gave me this scripture for today, and I think it's very appropriate. Uh, this uh, scripture for today is about touch, and it, it's about um, uncleanness and um, a time of, for, for a woman in this story, a time of great uncertainty and a lot of anxiety. And I know in our society today, um, you just look at the last week, we went from everything fairly normal to a lot of big turmoil. Uh, all the sporting events uh, canceled. Uh, schools have a, a closing date that we closed for, for a month, you know, at least in, in, in our area. Uh, you can't find toilet paper anywhere, you know, in the stores. I mean, there's just a lot of anxiety going on in the world today. And I really feel like this scripture that uh, we're talking about today does does uh, speak to that. Um, so I, I am going to have open with a, a word of prayer, and then we'll be looking at this. The scripture is going to come from Luke 8. If you've got a Bible you want to get in and, and have that ready, and uh, maybe even something to take notes on, because I, I do think that it's, it's, it's a very appropriate what I'll be sharing today. So let's just bow for a prayer. Lord, I do want to thank you. I want to thank you for the way that you are here. I want to thank you for your faithfulness. I know for a lot of us, this week has been a surprise what has happened, but I know for you it's not been a surprise. I, I know that, that you foresaw all this and you have provision for us. I just ask for your blessing as we just want to come to you and Hear your word and learn and grow together. In Jesus' name, amen. Okay, so um, in this uh, scripture today from, from Luke 8, uh, starting with chapter 40, you on to verse uh, 46. Um, Jesus is talking about, it, it's two events in Jesus' life. Um, uh, the one event starts and the other one inserts itself and then we go back to, to, to the one. Um, there is uh, uh, healings gonna, gonna happen. Um, in, in both of these, but it's interesting, uh, they both deal with faith. Uh, Jesus has two different kinds of things to, to say about faith with these two events, um, and he says it in, in, different, in different ways. And so uh, you might want to pay attention to, to what he's saying about, about faith here. So um, let me get my glasses on here and, and look at a little bit of this. Uh, starting at verse 40, uh, and I'm going from the, the uh, ESV. Now, when Jesus returned, the crowd welcomed him, for they were all waiting for him. And there came a man named Jairus, who was a ruler of the synagogue, and falling at Jesus' feet, he implored him to come to his house, for he had an only daughter, about 12 years old, and she was dying. Okay, so that's the first event you're going to have. Jesus uh, wants to go help this man who has, has a daughter who's dying. And now we come then to this second event, which, which uh, suddenly inserts itself and, and this, so this is the first one we talk about is this event. As Jesus went, the people pressed around him, and there was a woman who had a discharge of blood for 12 years. And though she had spent all her living on physicians, she could not be healed by anyone. Um, here, let me uh, just stop a minute and, and uh, try to get some context here. So here you've got a uh, woman who's had a discharge of blood for 12 years. In that culture at that time, if you are a woman and you have any discharge of blood, you're considered unclean for the period that, that the blood is flowing. So for 12 years, this woman um, really is not supposed to be going out in public. She can't touch certain things or certain people because that makes them unclean. Uh, she cannot go to the temple and, and worship. Uh, for her, this is a, a complete a period of anxiety um, you know, her, her world has, has completely changed and she has no idea how she's supposed to, to go on living. And she's basically at wit's end. And that's what brings her to this. She knows Jesus is there. She's heard about Jesus. She came up behind him 
and touched the fringe of his garment, and immediately her discharge of blood ceased. And Jesus said, Who was it that touched me? When all denied it, Peter said, Master, the crowds surround you and are pressing in on you. But Jesus said, Someone touched me, for I perceive that power has gone out from me. And the woman saw that. And when the woman saw that she was not hidden, she came trembling and falling down before him and declared in the presence of all why she had touched him. Let me, let me stop there. Um, when, when the scripture here starts talking about, and, and the woman came and saw that, that she was not hidden. Um, from her perspective, she was hoping, you know, uh, she had faith that, that, wow, this must be a man of God. And if I could just go touch him, I'll be healed. So she had the faith for that to happen, but she was really hoping that no one would notice. <laughs> she was hoping that the people around her would notice. She was hoping that the healer, Jesus, wouldn't notice. And so she was hoping to keep all of this hidden. But the scripture says, and when the woman saw that she was not hidden, and one of the things that tells me is, and this would be something you can write down in your notes, you can't hide from God, nor hide what's in your heart. Um, when we think that we can uh, live our lives and, and God doesn't know what's going on, uh, that's a myth. God always knows what's going on. So we, we can't hide from him, just like this woman couldn't hide from Jesus. But the beautiful part then too is, uh, at least it can, be, it can be beautiful, you can't hide what's in your heart. Her heart was pure. Um, she just wanted to be healed. Uh, she was at wits and she didn't know what else to do. And, and here was an opportunity to be healed. That's how, how she looked at it. So she reaches out to, to touch. And, and it's, it's interesting. Um, Jesus won't let this go. And, and in one sense, you think, oh, you know, boy, you know, I mean, he, he knows all things. Why doesn't he just let the woman go? But here's one reason why he wouldn't let it go. Unless she gets declared healed, she's still going to be unclean to everyone who's known her. For the last 12 years, she's been unclean. What's the difference now? But when Jesus forces her to come out of hiding, it forces her to also make a declaration that, yeah, you know what? I'm healed now. And then he can, he can confirm that. So, so she's, uh, immediately she's healed. Oh, yeah. Uh, and falling down before him, declared in the presence of all the people why she had touched him and how she had been immediately healed. And then he says to her, daughter, um, nowhere else in scripture does Jesus talk to a person with, with that name. Uh, it's an endearing name, daughter. Your faith has healed you. Go in peace. Go in shalom. Have shalom in, in your life. Um, there's there's uh, something to, to realize on, on that. When he talks about her faith having healed her, um, she went to Jesus thinking her touch would heal her, and then you can write this down, but it's her faith that healed her, not her touch. Um, and what I mean by that is she makes an act of faith. She realizes this is what God wants me to do, and so I'm gonna reach out there and I'm gonna touch this man of God because this is my salvation, this is my way to be healed. And it's her faith that healed her. That's what Jesus says, not the touch. Her act of faith was, was, was what God was honoring there. So immediately then he goes on, while he was speaking, someone from the ruler's house, so now we're going back to the first event, uh, Jairus the ruler, and so someone from the house comes to him and, and says, your daughter is dead. Do not trouble the teacher anymore. Um, what's happening here? Uh, this is a, a statement of faith limitation. Uh, this is this is saying, hey, it's too late for God to do anything. And and another thing for you to write down, it's never too late for God to act. Um, sometimes we think it is, and and we think in our minds, oh wow, the, the window of opportunity is gone. You know what can God do now? It's too late for God to act. But this is where uh, Jesus was talking about the faith of 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 this daughter. And, and now we're going to the other event, it's a different story. Uh, now he's going to be talking about different kinds of faith. So now then he says, don't be afraid. Uh, and, and again, um, in, in all the, the scriptures we've looked at in the last you know three weeks that have to do with Jesus' life right now through Peter's eyes, there is this idea, you can't live in your fear. 
don't be afraid. And it doesn't matter what's going on in, in, in the world we live in today, in the world Jesus was living in today. You can't live out of that fear. Instead, you live out of your faith. And so he's saying, don't be afraid, just have faith. Um, uh, some translations uh, here, the, the Greek word when, when Jesus says to the daughter, daughter, have you, your faith has healed you. That's the same Greek word used now when he says you need to have faith. But a lot of translations have faith in the one thing and then belief in the other, or faith in the one and trust in the other. I like translations that, that have, if they talk about uh, to the daughter, your trust has healed you, then he use the same word, trust her, because it, it's the same word. So here we have, just have faith. And then that, that uh, phrase, just have faith, can also can be translated as make an act of faith. And so here, here is, is, is again, your, 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 your fourth thing to write down, make an act of faith. Act on your faith. Um, for instance, if you feel like God is uh, in, in, in the midst of what, what we're doing uh, here and, and uh, maybe your business is going to be shut down or maybe you're a school teacher and you're, you're not going to be uh, working for a month, um, what is God saying for you to do with your time? Um, are there neighbors out there that they're both working and now their kids are at home? Is there ways to, to help out families where, where that is happening? Um, or, or maybe uh, your act of faith is, you know what? I know I'm supposed to be going over to my neighbor and just saying, hey, can I pray for you? Or a coworker or, or whatever. There's all these act of faith and we are called to act in faith. Uh, back to the, the scripture then. Um, so now we're going on to the, back to the original event. Jesus is, wants to go to Jairus' house and he's just telling him, hey, you know what? It's not too late. It just, just make an act of faith. And when he came to the house, he allowed no one to enter with him except Peter, James, and John, and the father and mother of the child. So he's going to go into the room where the child is laid and the child is dead, and, and, they, and they know that. And he's only going to take Peter, James, and John, and the mother and father in. But on the way in then, uh, there's, uh, in, in the custom of the day, uh, when there is someone dying like that, uh, the Jewish people would gather and, and they would start mourning. And, and, and they would be uh, calling out, and that was their way to comfort, you know, the, the mother and the father. And so there are people there who are already weeping and mourning. And he says, and all were weeping and mourning for her, but he said, do not weep, for she is not dead, but sleeping. And they laughed at him, knowing that she was dead. Now, uh, knowing that she was dead, uh, this is a, is a society that lives with death all the time. Uh, it's not like, uh, I don't remember which one of our children, uh, they were um, quite old and they said, well, I'd never seen a dead body before. And it might've been at the death of one of their uh, great grandparents or something like that. Uh, that's not the case here. Um, everybody saw death. They, they knew a dead body. They, they knew, they knew the, the woman was dead and the child was dead. So they laughed. Um, let me, let me share with you a, a couple other scriptures where people laughed in the old Testament where, uh, Abraham and, and uh, Sarai, uh, they, they don't have children yet. And uh, they're very old, um, 99, 90, you know, uh, they're, they're old. And then God is promising them, oh, I'm, I'm still going to uh, give a child to you. And the covenant that I make is going to go through that child. So th this is how they react to that. Uh, this comes from Genesis 17. And, and uh, uh, God is speaking about Sarai, Sarah. I will bless her, and moreover, I will give you a son by her. I will bless her, and she shall become nations. Kings of people shall come from her. Then Abraham fell on his face and laughed and said to himself, Shall a child be born to a man who is a hundred years old? Shall Sarah, who is ninety years old, bear a child? So that is in Genesis 17. And then in Genesis 18, uh, God is saying the same thing again, only now uh, Sarah's going to hear this. And the Lord said, I will surely return to you about this time next year, and Sarah, your wife, shall have a son. And Sarah was listening at the tent door behind him. Now Abraham and Sarah were old, advanced in years. The way of women had ceased to be with Sarah. So Sarah laughed to herself, saying, After I am worn out, and my Lord is old, shall I have pleasure? And the Lord said to Abraham, Why did Sarah laugh and say, Shall I indeed bear a child now that I am old? Is anything too hard for the Lord? It's never too hard for God. At the appointed time, I will return to you about this time next year and Sarah shall have a son. 
But Sarah denied it, saying, I did not laugh, for she was afraid. And he said, no, but you did laugh. Sometimes we laugh when we think God's mistaken. He doesn't get it. And that's ridiculous because God always knows what's going on and nothing's too hard for God. And so back to our, our scripture. So Jesus, taking the, child, taking the child's hand, called out, child, arise. Um, and it's interesting when you look at uh, the Mark uh, passage about this, this same story, um, the, the wording used there um, is the same wording that Peter's going to use in Acts 9 when he raises a child from the dead, when he's imitating Jesus. It's the same wording. Child arise, and her spirit returned, and she got up at once, and he directed that something should be given her to eat. And her parents were amazed, but he charged them to tell no one what had happened. Uh, that last uh, sentence about charging tell, no one to no one that they're not, they're not supposed to know what's happened, not going to tell anybody. Um, it's a fairly ridiculous statement went on the face of it because outside this room, there's a whole group of people who know the child's dead and now the child's going to be alive and now that, not even sick. The child's going to be eating and fine and, and everything's going to be good. Um, there's going to be shalom in this house. And uh, so I, I'm not, not sure what, what's behind that statement. But what I know is this. When you look at these two events, and you look at what happens in there, God wants us to live a life of faith where, where we're not living on by what we see and know. We're living by what we believe in and rely on. And that's the strength of God uh, to get us through hard times, uh, the strength of, of God to, to recognize um, I'm a servant of God and I can go do his bidding whether I think I can or not. Um, as I, as I look at this, this scripture, I'm, I'm struck how God can do anything and we need to continually, um, fight against the idea that, oh, it's too late and I don't know what's going to happen. And, and so I'm just going to hunker down in my little, uh, shell and I'm going to be safe from the world. And, uh, that's not the response of Christians, uh, particularly at a time of high anxiety, but to realize, you know what, this is not a surprise to God what's going on. He foresaw this happening and he'll get us through this. And so uh, just to ask that you just bow with me in, in prayer as we close the sermon. Lord God, I, I wanna thank you for the way that you are here. I wanna thank you for your presence in the world. And I pray that this can be a time when your light can shine, uh, that we can show the world what it means to follow you, uh, that we can live lives of grace and strength and relying on you and your strength, and that we can live lives of faith and make an act of faith and, and do the things that please you because that is what we are here on earth for. I just pray all this in the powerful name of Jesus. Amen. Go in peace.